Hello. This week we're going to be talking about the volcano. So this is week four, the first week of the volcano. So we're going to have week four and week five going over the volcano. And with the cigarette smoke, I really overloaded you guys with a whole bunch of variations on how to make different kinds of smoke. And I know I went through things really quickly. And I know I said you could go through the videos, repeat them go through them slower, go through the files slower, but it's still overwhelming. And, and I, and I recognize that. And on one hand, um, I don't like doing that. On the other hand, <laughs> you might need it. Um, uh, the effects world, there's so much going on and I've always tended to feel overwhelmed myself. And, and it's not that I'm trying to overwhelm you. However, Having said that, seeing everything that I did, I went through really quickly. The the main thing that you need to look at that as an overview of what's possible and an overview of how to think about solving effects and everything that's involved. That's the huge takeaway is that just realizing there's a lot of things out there. There's a lot more to learn. And if you walk away with that, with a smile on your face, then I'll, I'll be happy. And so for week, the next week, week four, week five, we're going to do the volcano, which is a giant explosion compared to um, a cigarette. <laughs> you know, it's it's so much bigger, and um, and and it's even it, it can it, it actually even be more complicated. Cigarette can be pretty complicated just because it's small doesn't mean it's not complicated. Um, the trouble with the volcano being more complicated is that it's a larger scale. And because rendering, volume rendering is voxels, we have three-dimensional voxels. And um, and the, the, the last couple of renders that I did didn't use volume rendering for the cigarette. They used the surface rendering, the, you know, the geometry surface with that uh, x-ray type shader effect on the smoke. Earlier one that I did um, had a voxel type of rendering. The voxel rendering, because it's using three-dimensional space, not only pixels that are X and Y, but three-dimensional space, um, and each one of those little boxes of a voxel contains data, um, and then you scale it from a cigarette smoke to a campfire, that, that can like double or triple it. You scale that to a volcano, well, you're, you're talking about thousands of sizes. And and that can really, for one thing, it can slow down your personal computer. Um, and you can even bring a large production render farm with the fastest computers that are in production to its knees. And so if it's not set up correctly. So we have to be very careful about it. And for this lesson, because we're going to be doing a volcano, which is huge, um, we're not going to go into the super realism of it just because your machines are going to get bogged down and you're not going to get anything done because it can't be done on a on a on anything less than, you know, like a really high-end production machine and with a render farm. <laughs> and so, um, and, and probably a lot of technical sports, especially by someone who hasn't done it before. So when we're going to, when we approach the, the volcano, what we're going to do is look at the principles of the particle animation and some of the basics of it so that you get an understanding. And, and this kind of can also backwards apply to what we do with the cigarette smoke. And, um, and this will serve you. And, 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 and my other concern is that because I went really fast through the cigarette, when we go through the volcano, we're going to kind of step back and look about really how we think about something, which is why I have a picture of this 3D character with a beard, which kind of looks like me, how I looked in 1991. <laughs> um, this was a 3D character I downloaded from Turbo Squid. Um, and uh, uh, and I used it for my thesis. I, I had a beard back then, and I was better looking back then. Anyway, so so this file that we're starting out with, week, week 4A, and I, I'm working on version 4 right now, but I might actually upload a newer one. So it's got a couple of things in it. 
and and, and we're, so we're talking about volcano but why are we looking at <coughs> the rendering of a person so i have this character um lewis and i got lewis uh i got lewis in the studio and that's the one we're looking at right here so lewis in the studio and you notice that the character it, it says it's locked and it's not reading from a file and so when in houdini if i had something in there um you know if i'm reading a file off of disk um then you would have to have that on disk if the node is locked in the bottom left corner and and i know one what you've already clicked on this and undid it and the character disappeared and then if you click on it again it might not reappear um you have to be careful with this node so what what this locking does is that it kind of freezes the geometry and it embeds the geometry into the Houdini file, which means that the base Houdini file is already bigger. And so all the data that's used to create that render, which um, it's not only the geometry, but it's also the color. It, the, the texture looks a little bit fuzzy because I use a texture map to color the points. So we're not looking at a texture map, we're looking at colored points. And and what, what happened was when I set this up, there's all these nodes that are chained together, chain, 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 chain together. And then um, and then I lock this null node, and then I deleted everything else. But if I unlock this, it's going to disappear. Okay, this is just about how Houdini works. Now, the reason why I did this is that I purchased this model from TurboSquid for my thesis. And, and I have the rights to use it for some things, but I don't really have the right to pass it on for other people to use. And so because I'm not giving you a file off of disk and I'm giving you this uh, uh, geometry without the texture maps, the colors are baked in, um, it, it kind of cripples its, its usage for other things. So, and, it, it, and please, please don't copy, paste, and use it um, because I want to uh, go along with the rights for TurboScript. So I'm using this for educational purposes, but um, uh, I, I also want people f to pay me properly for the work that I do. <laughs> and so I, I, I want to respect Turbo Squid as well. So, but, but anyway, um, I, I have in here because it's important about scale. And when we're talking about cigarette and we're talking about volcano, we got two different things. So um, I have, I have three cameras in my setup. I have um, camera portrait, which we're looking through right now. And, and I'm rendering a 1920 by 1080, uh, uh, although it's not showing up full size in this preview. If I hit space H, that, that's the resolution it's rendering at. Um, and, and it looks a little bit rough because I'm using point colors, not a texture map. And I'm using a 105 mil lens that would fit onto a 35 millimeter camera, like a high-end Canon or a high-end Nikon digital camera, full, full frame. And that kind of lens, um, it, it, standard for years, and 105 is called a portrait lens, which is used for, you know, about that, about that, you know, that that kind of a picture of portrait lens, uh, chest up. Um, and it, I grew up in a photo studio. My parents were photographers, so I learned all this stuff as a kid. And the camera height, this height, camera height is set at 1.6 meters, which is the eyes. And my rotation of my camera is zero. It's not looking down. I usually have it look down a little bit. This one's looking straight. And and if the camera's looking straight, the camera position is right in the middle of the X or the, the Y value. So right about where the mouth is. So the eyes of the camera, the eyes of the photographer are... The, the photographer is smaller than this guy. So um, the photographer's eyes would be right here, uh, right where the horizon is, right in the exact middle of the vertical. And this character is taller. Now, if I go into Lewis in the studio and I cl click on that node and then I go to the end and I hit the I button, it tells me that the size of this character is 1.818 meters and so that's his height the height up there my camera height is 1.6 which is right there 
and in his eyes would be a little bit taller. And um, I, I just wanted to emphasize how this needs to become like secondary thinking for everybody really working in animation and modeling to get scale correctly. But with effects, scale is really important and, and it's good to be aware of those things. And, and those are questions that when I interview people, I like to ask them a lot of times, what's the height of your camera? What's the height of your the, the man that's in your scene? What's the height of the tornado? What's the height of the building? And typically when I interview people who are trying to go from being a student to an employee, they will say, I don't know. <laughs> and on one hand, I understand why they say that and I kind of snicker inside me. But at the other hand, it's just like, we got to think about that height because we get, if we don't know how big things are and how high they are or whatever, we're going to get stuff wrong and we're guessing on numbers. And, and one of the things about the cigarette I mentioned once in a while in those videos is that I could go in there and quickly adjust some of those numbers <clears throat> to get the smoke to kind of look like I wanted it to, you know, like get it into the ballpark, not necessarily to final. Because I'm all, all, all already used to working the scale. I'm very familiar with that scale. So I can go in there and use those numbers and kind of massage it. Maybe I have it written in my notebook. Or maybe I just got it kind of memorized from use. And I know that if I'm going to do a cigarette, it's going to be this much. Because I mentioned several times, kind of like the, the ash, the, the, the flame size on the cigarette, the, the yellow glowing part, maybe is like a couple of millimeters. Um, and and I, I went in and I showed you that, you know, like uh, the units were like 0 0.0001, which is like one millimeter. And, uh, and, and here we are talking about this guy and the cigarette when we're supposed to be talking about volcanoes. But anyway, the takeaway from the previous classes, we were working at that scale. Now we're going to jump into something even bigger. And so Lewis here, he's like 1.8 meters tall. He's taller than the eyes of the photographer and probably the head of the photographer um, would be somewhere right up there. So um, <clears throat> anyway, that's the um, important thing. Now I have another view and that's called Mantra uh, body and camera full body. I have a camera full body, same size. And on his one, the the, the camera is still 1.6 meters away. It's 10 meters away from the the actor, the, the, the character. And it's looking down slightly at four degrees. And this lens is using a 50 millimeter lens which is is called 50 or 55 is it's i sometimes i see 60 but um it's referred to as a normal lens and normal meaning um there's there's kind of like less distortion um in, in what the camera sees and there's another lens that people sometimes call a normal lens which is 35 which is a slightly wide lens and the 35 when it when i hear a photographer any leibowitz calls a 35 millimeter lens a normal lens where my dad and some of the nikon reference that i use wouldn't call it 35 millimeter lens but she calls it normal because that's what we see when, when we look out how far we see to the right how far we see to the left that range of angle of view is normal for what you see but uh and and so so we have a difference but it's it adds a little bit of distortion to the image and so so anyway like so you'll you'll hear people talk a little bit about that i i grew up with lenses <laughs> and um i would travel around with the bag full of lenses and my dad taught me which was rich and so um I don't expect you to know this out of the box, but when you're working in production, you will hear people talk about this. So the things that I mentioned into you about lens, like a 105 being a portrait lens, uh, 50, 55, even a 60 being called a normal lens, which means it doesn't have distortion or has less distortion to it. 35 being a slightly wider lens, 
which for me is a wide angle lens and it has a little bit of distortion to it, meaning meaning things start bending off to the left and right. Um, uh, and with the, um, uh, but 35 having a normal, what we see like, you know, from our left periphery to our right periphery, of our view, we look as human beings, that's about what we see. And so this one, like here I'm, I have a 55. If I set that number to 35, I'm getting wider and I'm beginning to see where my backdrop item, it has its limitations. It doesn't go up high enough and it doesn't extend close enough. And my dad had a studio like this. It wasn't this big, but he had a studio with that round back on it. And a couple of times I moved a chair too close to there and it's paper and I put a hole in the paper and um, <laughs> maybe a hole in my head. Um, my dad wasn't happy at all. And um, uh, because, because it's not a physical wall that's solid that's bent, it's paper that can break. And then um, I learned my lesson about being careful in the studio. Uh, but anyway, uh, that, that, it, it, so if we didn't have that curve on the wall in the back, we'd have like a straight line where the floor meets the wall. And uh, a lot of studios don't have that. Um, they like this kind of blended look. Um, anyway, so 35 is, if, if, if I were standing 10 meters away from this character and looking, I, I might see all the way to the right and the left of that much. The characters, um, and so this would be my full view of vision, which, which is, you know, when I look out through my eyes, I don't, I don't have to wear glasses to see everything in focus if I look at far away. Um, it's pretty big. So if, if somebody's 10 meters away, it's going to look about like that. But my area of concentration is really going to be around that. So it might not look that far away. But when I think about it, like if I were to draw a picture of what I see looking straight forward, down to my foot, up to the ceiling, it's going to be about that size with the 35 millimeter lens. Um, now I'm going to go back and I'm going to change this to 50. Um, and so everything's in a little bit closer, not a super lot closer. Um, and, and, and another term I'm going to throw at you, which you need to write in your notebook, which you'll learn about later or you'll hear about later. Um, it's called flatten. And when you shoot photography in wide angle lenses, um, there will be distortion in the image, which the lens will do. Uh, lenses create distortion. And computer graphics, being able to do things perfectly with numbers, um, doesn't render distortion. It renders everything flat. And so one one problem that we have with putting uh, live action over th 3d 3d over live action is that um, with some lenses because the d distortion can be different between different brands of lenses and different settings and if you're using a zoom lens um, uh, the the degree of distortion can change over the range um, uh, so before they do when they do camera tracking which matches the 3D camera to the real camera, like if the cam camera's moving with a movie camera. Movie cameras use the same type of lens size. But most movie cameras, not all, but most movie cameras use the same kind of lens size as is used in like the 35 millimeter film still cameras, like the old Nikons, the old Canons, and also, which is true for the high end Canon, high end Nikon, uh, they use the same kind of lenses. And so the terminology is similar. Um, and the way of thinking about what lens for what thing is, is similar. Um, and I have to stop talking about photography stuff. Okay. But uh, so when I render this picture like this, it can have distortion if I shoot it with a real camera. Like if I use a 35 millimeter lens, there's going to be some bending in the picture that the 3D doesn't do. So they do this thing called flattening. You need to write this word down in your notebook because you're going to hear it later. Uh, maybe next year, or maybe in three years. Um, but when they flatten the picture is that they take the distortion out of it that a lens will have. 
And so there's special software that does this flattening. And then, then when they track the software, they track it with a flattened picture, which means that the, um, the distortion is taken out of it so that when we render something 3D and put over the background, it matches perfectly. It matches what the computer's thinking. And then, and then the mathematics behind that is fascinating but complex. Um, and and so for people that do track 3D tracking, they learn all about that, and compositors learn all about that. Um, and so then the 3D is rendered to put over the background. And then oftentimes, most at least of movies I've worked on, after they get the compositing done, then they unflatten the picture. So they put the distortion back into the picture. So it looks more like a real original lens that shot it. Um, and so um, it it dis it kind of undistorts or redistorts the background. So whatever the background got bent, it kind of pushes it back to that bending amount. And and then when it the 3D goes from being this flat picture to being bent like the lens would bend it. Um, and so uh, that's that's a workflow that uh, I know that I was using quite a bit 20 years ago. Um, when I was working at Digital Domain, one of my friends sitting near me was was doing the lens analysis for all these other lenses and and measuring the amount of distortion, and and really tedious work um, could be on borderline boring, but it's one of those things that's super critical to get things right. Anyway, uh, having having said all this, that's that's information for your future. So put it down in your notebook, write a circle about it. That's part of your vocabulary for later. Now, this still applies to what we're going to do because here is um, the man standing in a studio. And so he's he's like 1.8 meters tall. Now we're going to go to the next one, the volcano render. And let me make this uh, window full screen. And... Uh, the suspense is thrilling. And what do we have here? Uh, I'm missing something, so I'm going to go back. I'm going to go to my output. And I'm going to go to my volcano. And um, Lewis on the mountain. Now, Lewis, the, the 3D model, he's the same size, but but I put him at 000 XYZ, so his feet are standing right on 0 XYZ. And and now I got this big volcano, and somewhere in the middle of that volcano is 000. So the only thing that I did to change Lewis was um, I moved him 57 meters closer. So he's just close. He's just uh, further ahead of the center of the scene, and in my camera, my landscape camera, uh, I'm using a 35 millimeter lens, which is a wide angle lens. Which, if you're shooting outdoors, uh, if you're trying to get a whole volcano in there, you know, it depends on how far you are away. But so I'm using that slightly wider angle lens. Um, and then my distance, my camera is 121 meters ahead. So it's like roughly in the ballpark of 70, 75 meters in front of Lewis. Uh, you know, one uh, X1 or the Z minus the Z, whatever. So, so my camera is now way back. Uh, Lewis is much uh, further forward. And then the camera is even further forward or further backwards, depending on which way you're facing. Um, and we have this mountain. And so does this look like a volcano mountain? Kind of kind of looks like something blew up. And size-wise, he's 1.8 meters tall. And let's go in and look at this mountain. So this geovolcano will go inside that geometry. And th this is the bottom node. This is the one that's getting rendered. I click on the information. And this volcano... If we look over here in this part, 
we see the the center xyz xyz minimum value xyz so uh this one so how wide this shape is um and we have um max height and so the size here is really the y size x y z so it's 100 meters x by 26 meters y by 200 meters z um, and so it's much deeper than it is wide but it's 26 meters um, high and the the minimum up here see the xyz the minimum of the y is zero so uh, the bottom of the ground is at zero it's kind of like the same as the floor of the studio you can think of it as sea level you can think okay this is if this is sea level he's he's standing on the water or on on the sand right next to the water so if we think about that that he's right on the edge of the water then the the mountain kind of re recedes in the background, goes up high, but it's only going up 26 meters, which is, you know, I mean, there's there's buildings in Vancouver that are taller than that, um, so it's not that not that high, and and so I'm telling it to be a volcano, and and so um, now if I if I back up, you can see the process of how I made this volcano. And I don't really want to talk about it now. Um, and so we can think about this as one solid geometry that we get in. But this volcano was made from a flat grid, adding textures to it. Um, and I combined different textures to get some variety of the noise. Um, and then um, I used various wrangle attributes or height attributes to scale it. Like if I wanted to scale the height of the mountain, I'd scale this number here. Um, so the, the the most important thing is that how big is my mountain? And so it's only 26 meters tall. So it's like a it's pretty small 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 mountain. And um, let me go here to some of my reference that I got. So this I so here I. I googled volcano height map and um, I, I just got basically and so up here here's Vancouver in the map and so there's all these blah 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 information about height map now what a height map is is it's a black and white picture that is used to make geometry three-dimensional now this picture here um, uh, looks three-dimensional because but it's got light and shading on it now uh, and sometimes you'll see that when you google search something as a height map but our true height map is just black and white and black is going to be zero white's going to be one and then if you scale it you can you can use that to scale a flat grid, grid geometry and so like this one here it's got color built into it normals um, and so this is a height map was used to create this, like a normal shader maybe was used to render it, um, the, the, get the color in there, but uh, the black and white picture was what was used to get that height. Um, and and we Googled that. And then so I, um, now the, the mountain that I'm making isn't Mount Baker, but I'm gonna use Mount Baker as an example. Um, I used to live in Bellingham and actually uh, LaConnor, which is right down here. You can't see the name. It's near Mount Vernon. And Mount Baker is about a little bit closer there, Bellingham. But anyway, Mount Baker really loomed. And so when I when I was working in Volcano, I'd go back to LaConnor and, and Bellingham every, every weekend. Bellingham's right right here. And, and, and so Mount Baker was this huge presence in um in, in in our lives because it's a pretty big volcano in a ski area and uh okay here's another here's the here's the picture that i used to make my image so i downloaded that and it's this large open source scale uh terrain map and so this is what i use it's, it's not the best one and, and it's got a lot more variation in there that I like but that's what I use now here's Mount Baker 
and photographs. And so, um, and, and so I'd get up in the morning and I'd see this and here's a, and so Mount Baker, we'll go back to my map. It's, um, two and a half hour drive. It's, um, 141 kilometers from downtown Vancouver to the ski slope access near, near the peak. And so 141 kilometers, it's a, it's, it's over a hundred U S miles. And from Vancouver. So now, uh, so this camera is on the other side pointing toward downtown Vancouver and then pointing toward Mount Baker. So this camera, so we get this angle. So this camera is probably over here somewhere taken from this West Bay, probably lighthouse peak park. Um, toward downtown Vancouver where all those buildings are and then then we're and then behind Vancouver we're seeing Mount Baker down there and just from my experience with photography um, uh, it's still probably taken with a telephoto lens not an extreme telephoto lens but um, if we were to uh, it it's kind of making Mount Baker look bigger than it would with our normal eye. And so the 50, 50 millimeter lens is kind of where the distortion is with our normal eye. And when we go telephoto over 105, like um, like 85 is mild, uh, 105 is mild telephoto, 200 and above is starting to get extreme telephoto. <coughs> <coughs> Often used in wildlife photography, and the pictures start to flatten out. Like if you've ever seen like wildlife photography shot like a close-up of a small bird from far away, sometimes the, the focus is really narrow. But the um, uh, things look closer together than they would with the normal eye. And so we're getting a little bit of that distortion um, in, in, in these pictures of Vancouver, uh, Mont Baker from, from Vancouver. Um, like 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 that one right there, but um, and we can also kind of guess the camera height. It's probably taken off of a hill, just because of the the arrangement of things. And so, um, you know, having experience with photography and three D and setting up things, I I can look at a picture and kind of guesstimate. I'm not always right, but I'm usually close. Um, but anyway, so Mount Baker is this giant looming pre presence. Okay, and if we learn more about Mount Baker. Let's see. Uh, so here's another picture, a picture of Mount Baker erupting. This was in 2014, uh, a year before I mo first moved up to Canada. Um, oh, no, no. I, I was living in Van Vancouver or Bellingham when this happened. Uh, I worked in Vancouver, then came back to Bellingham, and then I went back to live in Bellingham. So this actually it happened while I was there. Um, and, and this is like the picture because it wasn't really that big of a deal because I heard about it and then you go look and then I think I saw something that looked like that a couple of days later. Um, but I never saw that big puff come out, even though it was like right in my back door. Um, and, but, so there's information about that now. Uh, so oh, here's the other picture. Uh, a lot of different pictures of, Van, of Mount Baker from Vancouver, just to show you that uh, that height extreme uh, difference between the two, uh, between the city and, and the mount, mountain's pretty big. Um, a lot of times the visibility isn't that good, so there can be days where it's hazy and we don't really see Mount Baker at all, like like this stock picture right here. Um, and then there's a few days where the sun's perfect, um, but you have to be, like if you're in the city, you don't even see it gets covered up by everything. Anyway, um, so now Mount Baker technical things um, and Mount Baker, it's is we have elevation. So um, that's the height above sea level. And so Mount Baker is 3,288 meters above sea level. And so it's, it's big, you know, it's not, it's not the biggest mountain in the world. It's not the biggest mountain in Washington state. 
but it's 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 no slouch, you know. Um, and so three thousand meters. Now back to Houdini. My mountain here is get the eye. Click on the eye. It's twenty six meters. So compared to Mount Baker, um, it's nothing. And and but it so twenty six. So Mount Baker is a hundred times bigger than my Houdini mountain. And uh, um, and so this is where this entire lesson that I'm showing you is important for an effects artist. Now, if I try to make my volcano with this one, it's a it's a good size difference between the man and the, the guy. But it but it's really in reality it would if this were to be Mount Baker completely blown up, I would have to make it a hundred times bigger. And um it's going to make the geometry a hundred times larger. It's going to make the voxels like a hundred times a hundred times a hundred bigger. And it's going to complicate the rendering process dramatically for doing volumes. And that's why it can kill a normal machine. And so when we do 3D, you know, when we're, we're doing like stuff that's close to the camera or in that, what I call the danger zone within like a city block, um, and working at correct normal scale is important. But when we get to this scale, sometimes it, in the production, we have to make a universal scale shift. And sometimes that's just for a sequence or a group of shots. Um, recently, I was working on a movie that had clouds and a mountain. And, it, and, and the mountain is um, maybe not quite the size of Mount Baker, but maybe half the size of Mount Baker. And they didn't scale the scene. And, and so I made these clouds and the clouds were at real resolution. And um, uh, so, uh, the, the mountain wasn't as tall as Mount Baker. The mountain was maybe half like some of the smaller mountains that are around Vancouver, like the, um, but, but not as tall as Mount Baker. And, but still big, still big enough to have clouds around the peaks of them, and 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 even then the clouds were like killer to render because there were so many. The voxels were so many voxels that fell up, and so it became a real battle of resolution to try to get it to render. So, so here's as a student something that you have to do, but you have to be aware of how much you do it to scale because if someone asks you the question when you have an interview you better darn well know the answer so let's say i'm doing this scene and and i got you know the lewis character in there but let's say i'm going to create the volume for the volcano at one one hundredth of real scale so one Houdini unit doesn't equal one meter. One Houdini unit equals a hundred meters. And so that would mean that in this picture, Lewis would be eight times a hundred, 800 meters tall. Um, and so, but then my mountain is going to be 26 times a hundred. So it's going to be, 2,600 meters tall, which just coincidentally is very close to the actual height of Mount Baker. So if, if Mount Baker is 2,600 meters tall and, and uh, Lewis here is 800 meters tall, he's, he's big, but he's not as big as the mountain, right? And so Lewis really is just going to be <clears throat> about as big as the trim on the front of his tennis shoe. <laughs> it's not even going to be as big as his ankle. He's get, the real Lewis is going to be like really smaller than one of these pixel boxes down here. But as an effects artist, it's important that you know these numbers when you scale something. Um, and, and it just becomes embarrassing during an interview 
uh, like I said, I interview people. A lot of times I don't expect them to know that. And they don't know it because their teachers never told them that it was important. So here am I at the beginning of your careers. It's important, you know, it, it's important. And some people will say it's not important. But then those are people that are just guessing about the numbers that they put in stuff and they can't consistently reproduce a good result. So some people, they say it's not important. <laughs> Throw those people off the boat and into the water with a life preserver and hope they'll survive. Okay. So anyway, um, a couple of other examples besides a mountain. Um, one demo reel I had had a meteorite hitting a um, like a, a lighthouse from, um, you know, meteorite came from the atmosphere, knocked out a, a lighthouse. So I, I asked the guy when I'm interviewing him, um, how tall was your lighthouse? And he didn't know. But he, he, he really had no clue how tall his lighthouse was. And, and it wasn't like, um, I made it to scale, but I don't know what the number is right off the hand, but I could look it up. Okay, that would be an acceptable answer. It's like, okay, you don't know, but you made it to scale. Uh, and And so that would be acceptable but he did, he didn't have any clue he just like modeled it and whatever height it was he put it in use of this scene and then then there's this meteorite flying through knocking out the thing and i asked him how fast is the meteorite moving he didn't know either and uh he didn't know because he didn't know <laughs> and it, and it's not like um and it showed that he didn't have any research. He didn't say like, well, and so I'm making up these numbers because I haven't looked it up. What is this? Well, a typical meteorite entering, you know, if, if, if the size of it is three centimeters across or five centimeters across when it's flying through the air and it hits the earth, typically they're going at 583 miles an hour or they're probably going faster than the speed of sound. Let's say, you know, a thousand miles an hour. It, it is like he didn't even know that. He didn't even know basically what the range of the speed of a meteorite would be flying in. He just animated it, which is what most people do. They just do it by eye. They don't think about reality. In effects, we're trying to make things look real. And when we try to make things look real, like if we do a drawing of somebody, we don't say, here's Charlie. Uh, let's make a uh, drawing of him. And you, and, and you don't go like go into another room. Charlie goes one way, you go to the other way. And you try to draw a picture of Charlie without looking at him. Um, but there's so many of visual effects artists that do just that. They'll go make a volcano. Okay. And then they don't do any research about it. And it's, and it's, it's a disappointing, disgusting and a waste of time and a waste of money. So don't do that. Okay, think about what you're doing. And so what we do is some resemblance to reality. And so reality is our starting point. And a lot of times the visual effects supervisor will change things. Like um, I, I learned that the on, on the movie Titanic, they made the boat um, like 30% or, or yeah, 30% larger than the real shape in relation to a height of the person, something like that. Um, and and the guy, the guy, <laughs> the guy that heard James Cameron ask for that w was in the room when James Cameron requested that. So it's a firsthand source. Um, and and uh, James Cameron wanted the boat to look bigger because of, uh, the problem is that when Titanic sailed, it was like the biggest boat in the world, right? But since then, like like the average cruise ship now makes Titanic look like nothing and so he was trying to get the boat to look a little bit bigger um a little bit more dramatic just because our sense of what big has changed over time anyway so he had a reason for it he knew exactly how much bigger it was going to be so um something like that happened and then um so that's one thing and it probably wasn't for all the shots it was probably just for select shots that the scale was changed um and um Otherwise, people walking through doorways, it'd be awkward, you know, that the door is actually much, you know, fit for a giant rather than a human. So, um, so that's one thing. Um, and, and the, um, 
another another awkward thing that like somebody made a tornado once. So somebody made a tornado coming up like from behind a building, and the tornado is destroying the building. So I and I I live in Tornado Alley here in Iowa. We're on the northern end of it. The tornadoes. Uh, we had 26 tornadoes in one day in December, which is like super weird. Uh, and, and fortunately, they didn't cause as much damage as the tornadoes down in the southeast United States did. Um, but uh, so I kind of grew up used to seeing tornadoes. And so the height of the cloud, like how like when you see a tornado, like going from the clouds down to the ground, how far is that? What's that distance? And so this person made a house getting destroyed by a tornado and set the camera out in front. And so the tornado, so the camera is kind of like set like from like this point of view. So here's the dude and here's the tornado coming in from behind him. And, um, and so the house gets destroyed, but we see it all in this one lens. Uh, and, and even if it's a wide angle lens, we saw it all in a wide angle lens. And, um, so I asked this person, how high is the tornado? How, how, how tall is your tornado? And, and they didn't, they didn't know how high it was. And I said, well, just guess how, how tall, how, how tall is the tornado? And they said a hundred feet. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, I, I didn't hire this person. Um, cause a, a tornado can be a mile high you know between the ground and the bottom of the clouds it can it can be a mile it could be less than that it could be more than that but a, a mile can be like a safe average a mile is 5280 feet just a little bit more than 100 feet <laughs> and so um the thing that it showed me was that when the person said 100 feet it showed me was that one thing is that they have no idea second thing is that they didn't do their research and they were trying to make the things look good from the camera. And if you get it to look, the problem with making something look good from a camera is that if they say, well, move the camera back 50 feet and we're going to do another shot from another angle. And, and if you do that, then you're going to see that this tornado is just this little dinky thing, uh, not even taller than a water tower in a small town, let alone reaching up to the sky. And, and it's just going to look ridiculous. And so um, if that happens, um, you have to redo all your math, all your uh, settings, all have to get changed. Everything's wrong. And you've wasted a lot of time. And then the second tornado that gets rendered is not going to look anything like the first one. So then the first one's going to have to be redone. And you basically wasted a lot of time, which is money, which is money spent, wasted on you, which means that why should they hire you? if they're going to waste a lot of money on having spent. Okay. Now I'm, I'm making my point and I want it to sink in deeply is that scale is definitely desperately important. And you have to think about scale always. So now if, if I'm going to say that, let's say this is Mount Baker and it blew up or, or a mountain similar to Mount Baker, uh, Mount Baker has all these other surrounding mountains around it, so uh, you you would never see anything from this view. So let's say this is a, a kind of volcano, um, and and let's say originally it was going to be the uh, high, but then what you know this was this is after it's blown up, so maybe the peak was originally up here where my camera's pointing, and then that all got blown up out of the way, and then blah 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 blah, and so let's say I'm working at one hundredth. And for one thing is that uh, my computer, I want to get the voxel count lower, the scale. So I'm going to scale everything down by 100. So rather than working at real scale, I'm going to be working at a reduced scale. And so everything else is going to be reduced by 100. So let's say I had a truck going through here on a highway. Then that highway is going to be 100th of the scale. So let's say we model the highway and a house and a truck at original full size scale, then we have to scale those down by a hundred so they will look natural. So the truck, truck in there is gonna be like, you know, is you know, probably as long as his boot, you know. Um and so things are gonna be really small, but they're gonna be relatively correct. 
So that's what working a scale means. And so we would work the scale. And in Houdini, if we have something that uses gravity, so like gravity is 9.86 uh, meters per second squared. So we'd have to reduce the gravity by 100 to get it to match. Because if we use, uh, if we re make everything 100th size of the original and leave gravity, the gravity is going to pull down much faster than it would. And then we're going to, they, they use the term blow the scale. You hear that term, like, put quotes around it, blow the scale. It means that the scale is no longer relevant. Um, now, in movie production, they blow the scale all the time. And that's the choice of the director and the visual effects supervisor. Um, in When I worked on the first Harry Potter movie, and there's an opening scene in Quidditch where it's like an establishing shot of Hogwarts with the Quidditch field behind it. And, and there's like, I think it's three, there's a... Uh, kids flying around under Quidditch broom just around this scene. And uh, I was on the simulation team that was doing hair and cloth. And I was I was working on, I mostly did hair simulation. I did cloth on one shot. Um, but the people that were doing the cloth, when they tried to apply the simulation to those characters, the cloth was stretching like, you know, 30 meters behind the character. And so they put a timer on it. They, they made a little tool so that they can measure the speed of the moving object. And the Quidditch characters were going at like 3,000 miles an hour. And early on, when they were working out the testing, uh, they uh, at Sony, they someone had a convertible or they rented a convertible. And they put a cape on somebody sitting, sitting in the back of a convertible and taking photographs of it. And they found out that the kind of the right speed of getting the cape to blow back on the character and the hair blowing but not out of control was something like 30 miles an hour. So the optimum speed for someone flying with a cape to have the motion of the cape to be nice was about 30 miles an hour. So they went out and filmed that realistically. and But the animation department animated the speed of these characters all over the place. And and the one of the problems with um, speed is that even if something is moving fast, the further away you get from it, the slower it looks like it's moving. And and this is true. Like if you watch airplanes landing at an airport, you see like a big a big uh, international carrier jet, um, wide wide bodied airplane landing at the airport. They kind of look like they're flying kind of slow, but they can be landing, you know, 200, 300 miles an hour when they hit the ground, which is pretty fast. And it's really fast looking if you're in front of it. Like if you're in that danger zone and uh, at the end of one block and the airplane is coming in to land from the other side of the block, it's going to plow through that block really quick. And um, you're not going to have time to get out of the way. You're not going to be able to move very far within a city block at the speed that jets landing. So the danger zone for a city block, that sense is really, you know, you're going to get run over. You know, it's going to be, da it's dangerous to be, you're going to hit by the engine or something. Um, but when you're, you know, a mile away or, or half a mile away, the plane kind of looks like it's floating, even though it's going the same speed. And so on Harry Potter, if they animated the characters moving at 30 miles an hour, and, and it's a wide establishing shot, they're not going to look like they're going that fast. So they animated it to look really fast. But the trouble was is that um, 3,000 miles an hour, yeah, that's three times the speed of sound. You know, that would kill more than kill somebody, just the wind friction hitting them. And so, so what does that have to do with you? So um, on Harry Potter... We had to one one of the guys in the effects crew. Uh, he got the title of reanimator, and so he had to take the animation we got from animation, scale it down so that the characters were moving at about thirty miles an hour. Then when we would do the simulation, and then the simulation would get put back on the original speed of the moving object. So it was simulated at thirty miles an hour. 
but then applied back to the faster speed so it looked nice and um and in order for us to get the effects done we had to do the effects at the real plausible speed to get it to look nice um and and if we didn't if we tried to animate each one to each speed all the characters were moving at different speeds so we'd be in there monkeying with the gravity and with the wind forces and the friction and the different stretchability of the the and and every shot would be a nightmare to work out so because the shots were reanimated all to the same relative speed we still had to do tweaking to our settings, but it was like minor tweaking. It wasn't major tweaking. And so the reanimation allowed us to work at scale. And then that got reapplied back to the faster moving, uh, like source. It's just like you attach one object to another and it travels with it. So it's moving at the same, you know, the speed it was animated at, but it was the effects were all done. And so, uh, a complex setup it wasn't a cheap fix um and um so that is the concerns of working to scale now as a junior animator are you expected to solve all of those problems no but you need to be aware that those are problems and that those are issues and you need to be aware that working to scale is important so this is the first lesson for the volcano and it has nothing to do with making the volcano except for setting up the scale so we're going to use this geometry that i i downloaded this image i made some changes to the image the distortion looking right and so we're going to work on this setup that is one one hundred the scale of reality so we're going to pretend this volcano is as big as Mount Baker, but in Houdini, our scale is going to be one Houdini unit doesn't equal one meter. One Houdini unit equals 100 times one, which is 100 meters. And uh, so we'll proceed on from there. So you'll get this file as it is. And so this is the base working file for the shot.